So today we're going to talk about decoupling deployments from releases using feature flags. Um, my name is Pablo Gonzalez. I'm a Salesforce architect at Salto, and I've been in the ecosystem for about 12 years. And I feel super nervous right now. Like, I feel my heart is going to come out of my chest. So just saying it out loud helps me a little bit. Um, OK, so for the agenda today, we're going to talk about the difference between deployments and releases. We're going to talk a little bit about continuous delivery. We're going to then. Huh. OK, then we're going to talk about feature flags. We're going to see a demo, and then we're going to talk about the limitations. All right, so first, deployments versus releases. So what is the difference? So a deployment, we can define it. OK, so this is not working, so I need to go back here. Um, a deployment, we can define it as the act of uploading, pushing, or creating metadata in a target Salesforce org, whereas releasing is making a feature available to end users. And sometimes this may seem obvious, but it's not, right? If you deploy something to an integration environment or to UAT, you're not really releasing. But typically, we do it when we deploy to production. To give you a real example, uh, at Salto, where I work for, we recently released a feature for CPQ deployments. So this feature has been in development since January. We actually completed this and we pushed this to production in April, but we didn't start to open it up until August for customers who were asking for it. And then now here in September, we're making it available to all customers. So this is a good example of how you can actually have code in production, fully deployed, but not really available to end users. And that's the difference between a deployment and a release. Now, I want to connect this to the topic of continuous delivery. So I was here in Dreamforce last year, and I spoke about uh, CICD. And I did mention feature flags briefly, but I wasn't able to really talk about it. So I'm happy to be back and you know, be able to connect these two topics. So what is continuous delivery? It's really not one thing. It's not something that you can see. It's not something that I can show you and say, here, that's what continuous delivery looks like. It's really a set of principles for software delivery. Some of these principles include continuous integration, version control, and a desire to automate everything that can be automated. That said, one of the core principles of, conti of continuous delivery is this notion of keeping your code base in a deployable state. And this is a very strange concept. If you start reading about continuous delivery, you're always going to come across this concept of keeping your code base in a deployable state. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you're doing version control, and if your main branch represents production, it means you can deploy the contents of main to your production environment at any time. You have so much confidence in the contents of main that you can come in on Tuesday morning and deploy to production without asking anyone. You can do it again on Friday morning. You can do it on Saturday evening because you're very confident about the contents of that branch. Now, if you think about it, there's nothing revolutionary about that because you can do that just by not merging untested or in-progress features into main, right? If you're using feature branches or release branches, you just don't merge that stuff until you know it's ready. So there's nothing really revolutionary about this concept. However, continuous delivery takes this to an extreme where you're actually encouraged to merge code even if it's not fully tested, even if it's still work in progress. You're supposed to merge that into your main branch and still deploy that to production while ensuring everything still works. So if you think about it, this is kind of like continuous integration taken to an extreme because you have code that is there, uh, but it's not really doing anything, and you're going to release it later. Now, how can you make sure that you have code that is you know, work in progress or that is not really tested yet? How can you keep that sort of dormant in your production environment? And the answer, one of the answers for that is feature flags. So feature flags is a technique to enable or disable uh, features or portions of your code without modifying the code itself. And it, it, this is typically done by having a configuration file or a database or some other system that determines whether the code should run or not. But the idea is that it's not something that you have to change the code. Really, it boils down to a simple if-else statement. So here's an example of what a feature flag would look like in Apex code. So for example, if the enhanced code editor feature is enabled, then we do something then we do something interesting. If it's not, then we do something else. 
Now, there are different use cases for feature flags. The first one is what I explained, which is hiding features until they are ready. So you may have code in production, integrated with all your production code, but it's not really available to end users yet. You may also have feature flags to enable additional debugging, right? Maybe you have a bunch of debug statements that are only printed if certain feature flag is enabled that you may want to use for additional troubleshooting. You may also have experimental features, maybe features that you're not too confident about, you're not sure if this really makes sense, so you can hide those behind feature flags and open them up to users and experiment how it works. Lastly, you can also do phase rollouts. Maybe you are confident in the feature, but you don't want to just do a big bad approach and release it to everyone. So maybe you want to release it on a you know, team by team basis. There are also different types of feature flags. You have user-based feature flags, which is basically, you know, they apply to certain users. I have access to run this code, my colleague doesn't have access. Or maybe it's based on department or some other way to segment users. You also have global feature flags, which is, you know, either it's enabled for the entire org or it's not. It's not user-based. Now, in Salesforce, I like to think of Salesforce as a feature flag first system. And what I mean by that is that we actually already have a lot of feature flagging functionality built in in Salesforce. If you think about it, there's a bunch of stuff that we can turn off or on without modifying the actual logic, like validation rules, right? You can turn them off. You also have different flow versions. You have Apex triggers. So these are just examples of things that come you know, out of the box that Typically, we don't think of them as feature flags, but really, that's, that's what they are. Now, if you want to implement your own feature flags, then there are different features in Salesforce that can help with this. You also have custom permissions, which is really just a string. It's just a name. So in this case, I define a custom permission called uh, feature can edit close accounts. And then what I do is I assign this custom permission to a permission set, and then I assign the permission set to different users. That on its own doesn't do anything. But what I can do later is I can use that, per, that custom permission name in my logic. So for example, here I have a validation rule that checks if the user has uh, that permission, then I can decide whether the validation rule should trigger or not. Also, Apex provides a standard class called Feature Management. This is 100% out of the box from Apex. And it has this um, method called check permission, which again, you can pass a string and it will check if the user has that custom permission assigned via permission set. Now, for global feature flags, custom metadata types are a good uh, way to enable this. So you may have some metadata type, for example, to disable certain triggers. Again, you can use custom metadata types in formula. So here you can see I'm using you know, to check if this trigger is enabled. You can also use custom metadata types uh, in Apex and then define if your logic should run based on the, on the values of those custom metadata types. Now, for this presentation, I wanted to kind of bring all this together and, and create it like a small framework, right, to, to help us think about feature flags in a bit more of a structured way. So I created a simple uh, open source project. Uh, you'll find the link later on the presentation. It's just called Salesforce Feature Flags. And it's just the, kind of like a small Apex framework for using feature flags in a consistent way. So I'm going to walk you through how it works. Uh, first, I have an entry point the Apex class. This is the main Apex class called Feature Flags. Uh, you have to instantiate that class. And then you have the evaluate method where you pass the name of the feature flag. And then you check that is enabled uh, method to see if it is enabled or not. So again, if your feature is enabled, do something interesting. If not, do something uninteresting. Now, how this works behind the scenes is it has a dual implementation. First, I use the standard feature management class to check if the user has that custom permission enabled. And if not, I check if maybe there is a custom metadata type with the same name. So as a developer using the code, you don't need to worry about whether the feature flag is implemented at a user level or global level. You can just call the method, and it will do that check for you. Also, the method doesn't return a simple true or false statement because that's not enough. You actually need to understand why is the feature flag enabled for this user. Because there's a lot of different reasons. Maybe 
the user has the custom permission. Maybe the custom permission exists, but the user doesn't have it. Or maybe there is a metadata type, but it's enabled or disabled. Or maybe you passed a name that doesn't even exist as a feature, as a metadata type or a custom permission. So in that case, we return a no flag uh, found uh, parameter. It's also available for Lightning Web Components. So here it's a little bit different because it's harder to return a like a data structure. So here, basically, you import the method LWC evaluate, you pass the feature flag name, and then again, you check if it is enabled, do something interested in your JavaScript code. If it's not, do something else. Now, testing with feature flags is a little bit complicated. And if I had more time uh, for this session, I would spend more time on that. Uh, at a high level, you need to test your code with different permutations of the feature flag, right? What if the feature flag is enabled or if it's disabled? How does that affect your code coverage? Uh, there is more information on the repo because, again, it's, it's a big topic. But at a high level, you can have two approaches. One, which is kind of like a brute force approach where you just force a feature flag to be true or false during a text ex test execution. Or you may use dependency injection to basically have like a more concrete implementation of your feature flags at runtime. Again, if I had more time, I would spend more time on that. Now, there are some limitations of, of thinking about feature flags in Salesforce. So the first one is it's really hard to track where a feature flag is used, right? Because they're not really a con they're, they're not a metadata type, right? As I, as I showed you earlier, it's a combination of different things. You may have custom permissions, custom metadata types. So if you have that string, you know, can edit close accounts, it's hard to find, you know, where is that actually used. So for that, I can recommend a few free tools. You have Happy Soup, you have a Salto free tier, which also allows for uh, you know, searching for any string across your Salesforce org. And if you're a developer, then you can also just download your metadata and Visual Studio code and just do a simple text search to find where that string is used. Another problem is the lack of metadata bundles. Like, if you think about it, you know, these examples are obviously very simple because it's just Apex. But in the real world, a, a real functional feature would be maybe three new fields, one flow, a bit of Apex, and some page layout changes. We don't have a way in Salesforce to bundle that together in a logical way and say, this is one feature, right? It's just a bunch of metadata that is disconnected. And so if we had a way to bundle this thing and say, this is one feature, potentially it'd be easier to say, OK, I'm going to turn this feature on or off. But it's not really possible. The other problem is obviously it's very, well, it's impossible actually to hide schema changes, right? Like if you are, if your new feature contains custom fields and maybe a new object or sharing settings, you can't hide that behind a feature flag. The only way you can hide that is using version control, right? And maybe hide that behind a feature branch and actually not deploy it until a later time. So it's not really something that you can do for everything. I think it makes more sense for Apex and Lightning Web Components. Uh, some resources here. Um, that is the link to the GitHub repo with the uh, Salesforce Feature Flags framework. There's also a really good article by Martin Fowler on feature flags and the, all the different types of feature flags and you, how you should think about them. And I also have a blog, pablogonzalez.io, where I talk a lot about Salesforce DevOps and CICD. And uh, thank you very much.